G'day, my name is Andrew Johnson. I'm talking with you today from Townsville, Australia. I'd like to commence by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I meet with you virtually today, the Gurrumbul Burra, Wulgarukaba people and the Bindal clan and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It does seem a little odd to be talking with you about COVID-19 from Townsville. We have been very much spared the ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic, recording only 34 cases throughout our population of 250,000 people. What I'll share with you today is my experience working in a quaternary hospital in Brisbane, our capital city of Queensland, where I was on secondment for six months at the, uh, from March 2020. In that role, I was responsible for the COVID-19 response and as a result of that, became deeply involved in the development of a framework for ethical decision-making for our clinicians. Early in my time at the Princess Alexandra Hospital on the 10th of March, 2020, our Chief Health Officer, Dr. Jeanette Young, pulled together 150 or so people who were largely responsible for the delivery of our pandemic uh, response. She issued us a very clear challenge for our preparation. Based on the international experience, she directed that we find ways of tripling our capacity to receive COVID-like patients in our emergency departments and to double our intensive care capacity. This was clearly going to be a major challenge. Key groups were all represented in this meeting and several of the uh, participants had a, uh, had a talking spot. One of those was the chief executive of our Health Consumers Queensland group, Melissa Fox. Melissa got up and embarrassed us all. She pointed out that at all phases of our planning to date, we had failed to include the consumer, an abject failure. We were, of course, deeply focused. We were focused on the issues that we could see. We were focused particularly on our capacity to deliver care, and that relied heavily on our clinicians. And our clinicians were telling us they were worried. That they were watching what was happening internationally. They saw what many of their compatriots in other countries, and probably in some of yours, were having to deal with. For them, this was the elephant in the room. How would they deal with it when they had to make the difficult decisions about who to ventilate, who to admit to hospital? Would we back them? Would we give them the support that re was required? My role as a member of the uh, health leadership team was as part of the executive directors of medical services group, the chief medical officers of Queensland. Between us, we decided that we needed to address this. And myself and a colleague undertook a lead role to bring together a framework for ethical decision-making for our clinicians. So if we're going to approach this wicked problem, we needed to make sure that we had the right people in the room. So my colleague and I mapped out who we thought might need to be involved in bringing together such a, a technically difficult and complex issue that involved not only medical expertise, but an understanding of ethical principles, an understanding of how people worked, an understanding of what was allowable within our system. We started with the ethicists, and both my colleague Andrew and I had uh, ethicists on our staff. We brought them together and shared the issue and I'd have to say, it's one of the most excited I've ever seen an ethicist uh, in the flesh. They were itching to get into the issue. Between us, we came up with a list of those people that we thought would be able to make a meaningful contribution and those that we thought might be able to kill off a good idea. We looked at people from each of the different professional craft groups. We thought about who was most impacted and who had raised the issues the most. 
We thought about those who had power within the system and those who had influence, those who could connect with others and bring them together around a common cause. Determined to do something differently, we decided to approach the Chief Executive of Health Consumers Queensland and ask, how can you help us? What do you think you might be able to offer to help us deal with this wicked problem? The response was phenomenal. Uh, anyone would think that they were waiting to be consulted. Within the space of 10 days, they had taken on board a draft discussion paper that, that our ethicists generated, and they took that out for consultation. Firstly, they took our paper to their consumer advisory group that had been well established for some time and had been used for various consultations uh, within the state. This group were well versed in, uh, in the consumer advocacy area and were given a series of seven questions to address. Uh, the 10 people involved in the consumer advisory group uh, provided us with comprehensive responses to these questions. And they were the questions that the consumers generated themselves. The next stage, and this really blew me away, was that in that time span, they managed to get 10 kitchen table meetings occurring right across our community. Each of these meetings had seven to 10 people involved and they were brought together by a consumer, a discussion by consumers with consumers led by consumers. And they responded to another series of questions. We had a comprehensive report provided to us within one week of asking the question with nearly 100 people having been consulted over a range of very specific and very insightful questions. The very abbreviated questions that were put to the kitchen table meetings included what they saw as the top three priorities in the COVID response. What values they believed should be applied in decision making around that response. What level of transparency did they expect from the authorities? What would they like to know and when? And have they prepared advanced care plans which determine what their wishes are and what their statement of choices is for their own care should that be required? To be honest, this was a leap of faith. We had concerns, I guess, that our consumers may have quite unrealistic expectations of what could be offered in the time of disaster. And indeed, there was some of that feedback where people expected that they would be able to access the same standards of care, regardless of the circumstances. But that was by no means the majority. In fact, the huge volume of the report and the feedback that we received was that people understood that these were incredibly difficult times and that there would be incredibly difficult questions and incredibly difficult problems. What they wanted was honesty. They wanted transparency and they wanted to be engaged in the development of the solutions. Getting the consumers around the table was the first and probably the most important step. It gave us a level of authenticity. It gave us a sense of focus. These were the people who were going to be most affected. How did we serve them best? So we brought together that group of people who could help us make decisions and those who could disrupt decisions. We brought them together on the one day. We narrowed the group down to 25 people and they represented around about 15 different groups. So the divergence of opinions we were bringing together was quite extreme. We knew that before we started and it was a very, very challenging day. Over the course of six hours, the big issues were debated. There was a lot of challenging input 
Each of those 15 groups were invited to give their three to five minute presentation of the things that most concerned them. Some of that was extremely difficult, particularly given that we had a strong consumer presence where there was actually a level of debate about what was right and wrong, where there was a true dilemma. And each, as they heard the other's perspective, came to realise that maybe this was more complex than they understood. The debate was largely constructed then under the ethical principles of autonomy. And the big issues there were who does actually get to make the decision? Normally, of course, we would expect that patients and families would be at least engaged in a shared decision-making process. Was that actually going to be possible? The principle of justice was equally challenging. We live in an environment where we have vulnerable populations, of course, the elderly, residents in aged care, uh, those with disability, and really importantly for us, our First Nations people who uh, enjoy a far lower standard of general health than the general community. The justice principle required us to think about how we deal with these different groups and allow them access to appropriate care whilst recognising the very real challenges that are represented in providing them with that care and establishing the, uh, the opportunity for them to benefit from the same level of care as others. And living in a very large and regionalised state with very centralised expertise within major cities, there was a major issue with access to care based on location. Thirdly, as we considered the issue of beneficence, the question came in as to who gets what level of treatment? Is there to be a rationing of care? If so, how does that occur? And do we actually treat any groups preferentially? And particularly here in a room very uh, significantly uh, stacked with caregivers, do we provide preference to caregivers? The principle of non-maleficence, first do no harm. Well. In the context of uh, COVID-19 and what we were seeing coming through from uh, colleagues overseas, the difficult decisions about things like withdrawal of care, how do they get made in the context where we're pulling care away from people who would normally be uh, able to continue receiving that care? What do we do when we look at patients in or residents in nursing homes uh, developing COVID? Do we leave them there in the knowledge that they will in fact represent a, a very intensive nidus of infection for their, their co-residents? And what do we expect of our carers? Do we expect them to put themselves at risk? How do we meet our obligations to our carers? In short, we discussed the undiscussable and much to our delight and surprise, by the end of the day, we'd come out with a simple rubric for a very complex problem. The starting point of that was a threshold test, which would move with the times of a pandemic. But based upon a, a environment of trust, compassion and communication, an evidence-based assessment would be made of the risk of death, both with and without treatment, in the current context with the availability of the resources that were currently available. And considering the long-term survival related to pre-existing comorbidities, that simple threshold test got all groups across the line. Obviously, the issue was vastly more complex than a simple three-line solution. But by the end of the day, we had an agreed upon approach that we could take forward for broader consultation, something that could be picked up in the middle of the night by a tired clinician and applied to the decision that was based in front of them. Obviously, the issue didn't finish there.
we had a small group of people who were representative of uh, a large segment of our community and our uh, healthcare providers. But we had to move forward and we had to do it quickly. We were at a stage where we were anticipating within Australia to be overwhelmed within the space of weeks. We had to keep moving. The next stage of deliberation was pulling together a huge group of people from across uh, Queensland with what we call the Clinical Senate. Only one week after that initial meeting, we had a virtual forum of well over 100 people from across the state, indeed from around the country. This group considered our proposal and some others from uh, emergency and intensive care colleagues to bring it down to a more granular level. And over the space of again, one more day, we reached a level of consensus. At the end of that day, we had a draft that people could rely upon, again, in the middle of the night, uh, in a remote area or in a tertiary centre to guide their decision making as to how they should approach the situation they faced. Within three weeks, this had been converted into a published document auspiced by our State Health Department. We were so proud of this achievement that we put it up for publication. This had been identified by the Health Consumers of Australia as the benchmark approach to dealing with co-design with consumers. We were, I think justifiably, incredibly proud. Every good story needs a twist in the tale. It seems that once Queensland and Australia had got past the initial threat with the pandemic, and we found ourselves in a situation where we had effectively zero community transmission in Queensland and very low transmission in most other areas of the country. People went cold on the idea of having an agreed document. And in the dark of night, the lawyers got hold of it and somehow this slipped off our uh, electronic systems and the advice slipped away from our clinicians. But of course, they printed it off. Whilst we were obviously devastated that our work had been taken down officially, we know that what went into creating those guidelines was a level of community, of co-design, of engagement that set a new benchmark. We believe that should it be required, these guidelines themselves will be resurrected but we have all learnt. We've learnt how to do this, how to do this incredibly important task and how to do it in a time of crisis. We will all take lessons away from COVID-19. It's going to take us years to unpick what has occurred, what went well, what went badly. The one thing that comes through most strongly for me is the power of the consumer and co-design.